Well, it's so lovely to see you again. Uh, uh, welcome to those of you that are visiting. It's lovely to have you uh, here with us uh, this morning. As you can probably tell, Karen and I managed to go away for a few days. We had a little holiday, and for once, we actually got the sun uh, in Cornwall, which was amazing, and it's a shock wearing long trousers, having worn uh, shorts for a whole week, but it's, uh, it was just a glorious time. And so th- for those of you that prayed for us to have a rest, we did, and it's great to be back. And... Um, I was just thinking as Joe and Sue were up here sort of uh, sharing about Kids Church, that, that, that we've been here, a number of us have been here for, for 20 years, and we've, I think over the years, literally seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of kids through Kids Church over those 20 years. And our vision statement is that we would make committed followers of Christ who change communities and nations for him. And, and those of us that have been here for a long time now see kids that have been in this kids' church in positions of influence and significance as they're working their way through uh, arenas uh, of education and, uh, and medicine and sort of local governments and, and business. And I don't know about you, but for, for kids, to see kids get saved here, to be influencing a world out there really excites me. So when you are committing to kids' church and involved in kids' church, you are truly playing your part in shaping this community and shaping the nation as we invest in young people. So I just want to encourage you to keep praying and keep serving and giving yourself uh, to this key area uh, for us here. Now, uh, how many of you here, uh, this is not a trick question, by the way, so you can put your hands up. I'm not going to pick on anybody, but, but how many of you here like going to the movies, genuinely? Like, like going to... Okay, now, now, now keep your hands up. Um, uh, how many of you like to get there in time for the previews, all the trailers? All right, hands up. And who doesn't like to get there in time for the trailers? Now, now, you can see that Carrie and I are in opposite camps, as are Tim and Hills. Uh, you need to know that one of the reasons I like to get there is I get some of my best ideas for messages and sermons from the, uh, as you've probably worked out, from the, um, from the trailers and fr- from the uh, movies. And so I like to be there on time, and I like to see the advertisements, I like to see the trailers, uh, because I want to know what I don't want to go and see. Uh, but I know that those of you that don't want to be there probably don't want to be there for a number of reasons, some of which sort of make sense to somebody uh, like me. I, I often think that the previews or the trailers give too much of the movie away. Have you, have you seen that? You know, just sometimes they, they show all the funny scenes or they show that the boy does get the girl or the girl does get the boy or, the, or that the mystery gets solved or whatever it is. And, and so when you sit down and, and watch the, the movie itself, it's a little bit of an anti-climax because you've already watched the whole thing condensed into two minutes uh, you know, of a trailer. So I understand why those of you in, who don't want to see it you know, don't want to do it too much. Another reason uh, why I think that people aren't always fans of the previews or the trailers is that so often they promise what they can't really deliver. And the truth is that you can make any movie sound really, really exciting if you want to. You can, if you can condense two hours of anything into two minutes, you can make it look really good. If you throw in the right sort of music and the right sort of voiceover, as it were, that, you know, if you get the official sort of voiceover voice, you know, uh, then you can make it really uh, interested. And, and it's why I think that many of us don't feel that we can really trust the, the trailers. So let me demonstrate how this can work um, for you. Uh, and, and I want to tell you a, 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 about a film that, that star uh, a couple called uh, Tim and Hills. Uh, and, and when they were first uh, married, and it's a film about a, a little incident in a hotel when they were on holiday. And in my mind, I've created this sort of audio clip that you could imagine um, what it might sound like. So you've got to imagine the music being played. But, but here is the trailer uh, for the film. Tim and Hills, okay, in a world where one man, one decision, and one desire would change everything. (laughs) Tim grew, was an ordinary man, until one day his life came crumbling down around him. The dark secret of what took place in the hotel on a Greek island would come tonight. (laughs) A young wife is coerced by her trusted husband into skinny dipping in the hot tub outside their chalet. Some way, somehow, the sliding door unlocked itself, leaving them, leaving them hopelessly trapped outside with a single towel. Tim Grew stars as Tim Grew in the role of a lifetime in a moment of desperation that would define a man forever. What would Tim Grew do? Find out this summer in the movie, Two People, One Towel. (laughs) 
I don't know about you, but that sounds quite exciting. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I want to go. Uh, you just wonder whether it's true or not, don't you? Whether I've just let go of their sort of... Do you know, you can make any story sound like it is a great adventure if you get the right music and the right voiceover guy. And every once in a while, actually, you're sitting in a movie, aren't you, and, and with a friend or a daughter or a spouse or dating partner, or, you know, and, and you've had this thing, you're watching the trailer, and it's there in front of you, and you suddenly look at each other and you say, I've got to watch that. I've got to see that film, because you get excited about the coming attraction. And of course, they always close the uh, movie trailer uh, section, don't they, with the two words, coming soon in a cinema near you. And you're excited to see that movie, the film, because the trailer, the preview, has built anticipation. So here's what we want to do as we study through um, Matthew 8 over the next few weeks in this series. We want to get a glimpse of what is coming soon in heaven. You know, I, I was with my father yesterday. Uh, he's celebrating his uh, 94th birthday uh, this weekend. Uh, he's looking forward to what's coming soon. He's lost his sight, his body is sort of breaking down on him. He's desperate to go home. He's looking forward to what is coming soon. And so as we do this series, actually we want to build you know, a sense of anticipation, a sense of excitement about that day. It might come sooner for him than some of us, but it's coming. And this is, this series, a trailer. This chapter, actually, in Matthew, is a preview of what God will do when one day he makes all things right. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew 8. And let me just give you a little bit of context here. If this is unfamiliar to you, this comes just after the Sermon on the Mount, which is well known to many. And Jesus has been teaching the crowds with incredible you know, profundity. And, and, and Matthew 7 ends by, by pointing out that the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching. And then chapter 8 begins where, where we see a different side of, of Jesus' ministry. And, and he's going to show us the, the, the different miracles that Jesus worked while Jesus was, was here on, on earth. And he's going to give us a, a glimpse of the power that he had whilst he lived and worked on this planet. So as we study these different trailers, these different previews, and these different miracles, you know, we're going to see, begin to see the, the, the power that Jesus had for different areas in our lives. And, and as we look at these miracles over the next few weeks, I, I, I just want to do a very, very quick recap by way of introduction of, of, of why Jesus worked miracles in his life. The first reason is this, his miracles validated his divinity. You know, for, for hundreds of years, uh, the Jews, the Jewish nation had been waiting for a, a, a Messiah, for, for the promised one. They'd been looking out for him. And, and, and the miracles were essentially the way that Jesus you know, um, worked out his credentials. He said, you know, you know, here I am. This is me. Because of these miracles, I am the one that you're looking for. So they validated his divinity. Secondly, uh, the, the, the miracles of Jesus deepened the faith of his followers. So we witnessed this as we watched the crowds that followed him, the disciples that were with him. They followed Jesus throughout his life and they saw him demonstrating his power again and again and, and, and their faith was deepened and their faith was strengthened as they saw this happening. So, so many of us who've been Christians for, for years understand you know, how this works. Um, for instance, I, I have absolute faith that if we manage to get people on Alpha we'll see people come into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because for 20 years, I've seen hundreds and thousands of people come through the Alpha course here and meet with Jesus and have their lives transformed and changed. My faith is strengthened and deepened in that area. And, and with these miracles, what we see is, is, is the people around Jesus, their faith being deepened and strengthened, and he's going to demonstrate his power as he demonstrates his power over the human body. So... Here we are in this chapter, and we have Jesus coming down from the mountainside. He's finished his teaching. He comes down, and it says, large crowds followed him. In the verse 2, chapter 8, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, now leprosy, we know this, was a horrible death sentence. 
And most of us have at least some understanding of what happened to, to a leper. You know, they would lose sort of feeling in their extremities. Uh, uh, but I, because I was preaching on this, I, I wanted to do a little bit of research in this area and came across a guy called Dr. Paul Brandt, who's considered to be a leading expert in the field of leprosy, and he spent a lot of time out in underdeveloped parts of the world studying the disease. And he says this, the, the, the irony of leprosy is not that you just lose sensation in, 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 in your extremities, but you have extreme pain in your joints as well. So he, he describes scenes in places like India where beggars would be sleeping in the gutters and rats would be gnawing on, on, on their fingers, on the flesh, and they, and they wouldn't feel it. They wouldn't feel the pain in their fingers, but they would feel this incredible pain in, in, in their joints. So there's this extraordinary sort of extreme here, but not only that, but a leper was also a social outcast. As soon as they were diagnosed with the disease, they were taken away from family, they were removed from their friends, they were quarantined, they had no physical contact with anyone. You know, there is this you know, visual evidence of leprosy, the discoloration of the skin, the decaying sores, this putrid smell that would follow every leper because of this decaying flesh. And essentially in the first century, lepers were considered to be spiritually cursed. It was like God's curse was upon them, it was thought. And so, so if, if lepers were ever in and around a social setting where there were other people, you would hear them, and you've heard this said before, shouting out, unclean, unclean, and, and to let people know that they should stay away. So this is this man's life. This is his life, okay? It's a horrible disease. And physically and, and spiritually and relationally, he is cut off. And yet here he comes to Jesus. And he is risking humiliation. He is risking ridicule because he believes that Jesus can save him from all of this. And, and I want you to notice how he, he, he asks Jesus for, for, for healing. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And, and I really love the, the spirit that the leper demonstrates uh, here because, listen for him, it's not a question of whether Jesus can. It's a question of whether he will. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And I, I just want to say this as graciously as I can. In some ways, I think the leper's faith is a lot further along than where many of us are. He, he knows Jesus can. The question for him is, will he? So, so, and I, so I want to take a step back this morning because I think that many of us are a step further back actually and have us honestly ask the question, can Jesus? Can Jesus? Does he have that kind of power? You know, I'm not going to ask you to stick your hands up um, because I know that if I did and I, I asked for a show of hands and asked the question, do you believe in miracles? I know that many of you would raise your, your hands. We would say that we believe in miracles. But, 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 but when I, I talk about miracles, I mean what we're looking at here in Matthew 8, that Jesus could heal a disease like leprosy, that he has that kind of power. I mean, for many of us, we, we believe in miracles, but our definition of miracles is quite broad. I, I was... Um, talking to a guy a little while ago who had decided he wanted to take up uh, riding a motorbike. The last time he'd ridden a bike uh, had been many, many moons before, and he hadn't realised that he had to go down to DVLC, as it were, all this little place, and, uh, and retake the theory part of his test, uh, which meant sitting in front of a bank of computers with a bunch of spotty teenagers uh, and alongside them and take this test. This is not me, and I'm not absolutely not going to tell you who it was, because you, you might think it was a bit naughty. Um, but um, he's sitting there in front of the screens, this bank of screens, and it's multiple choice answers. And as the answers are coming around, he realizes that he's in real trouble. Because whereas he thought he actually knew the rules of the highway quite well, he realized that there were many more options than he thought to the right answer. And as he was sitting there with these kids all around him, he could feel, as a middle-aged man, he could feel the sweat dripping down his back. And he knows that if he goes home and he's failed this part, of the, this part of the test, the theory test, that he's going to convince his wife that he is as bad in terms of road awareness as she's always told him he was. <laughs> he's in absolutely no preparation or revision for this at all. And he knows he's in real trouble. When, as he's sitting there at the desk, there's a lady who's meant to be sort of invigilating walks past and looks down at the answer and says, are you sure that you want to answer B to that question? And he quickly unmarks B and says, no, I definitely don't want to do B. He has no idea, though, because he's still got the option of A, C, D, and E. And 
She just leans over and says, I, I think you're probably wanting to press D for that one, aren't you? And he looks up to the heavens and says, thank you, Jesus, and <laughs> presses that. And then a little bit later on, she comes around again, and he's struggling, and she looks over the shoulder and says, I, I, I don't think you think A is the right answer for that one, do you? Unmarks it, and she gives him a little hint that it's E, so he presses down on E, and he came out. I remember him saying to me, you know, you know Mark, you know, I experienced a miracle in the uh, theory test center a little while ago. I believe in miracles, you know, in the testing process. Now, the truth is, that is how many people define the miraculous. If we sort of managed to get to church on time this morning and all the lights were green rather than red, that's a miracle for some of us. You know, if we found a pair of socks that actually matched for some of us, that's a miracle. If we got a, a parking space as near as possible to the church and we didn't have to walk too far, that is a miracle for a lot, a lot of us. And that's the way we define miracles. Now, I know clearly the Bible says that we should give thanks in all circumstances. So by all means, if you find a pair of socks that matches... Or you get a little bit of help in a theory test, give thanks. But they're not really miracles, as we study them here in Matthew 8. Miracles defy scientific explanation. They cannot be explained by natural causes or consequences. Now, do you believe in those kind of miracles? Do you believe that God has that kind of power? Not that he just did those sort of things whilst he was here on planet Earth, but that he's living and powerful in our lives today. You know, do you believe that? In spite of frustration and disappointment along the way at times. If you do, I think it just changes the way that we live our lives. Because if we really believe that Jesus can, I think that our praying wouldn't be such a challenge. I don't think that finding time to spend daily with God in prayer would be too difficult if we really believe that Jesus can. You know, for you or for me to say, which we do from time to time, I'm having a really hard time in my prayer life. I just don't really have time. I'm too busy. I have too much on. I'm struggling. You know, what we're really doing when we say that is that we don't have faith in the power of God. Because if we really believe that Jesus can then nothing would stop us from going to him like this leper does and asking for help. So here's my question. Do you believe that Jesus can? Fill in the blank for whatever it is in your life. Do you believe that Jesus can? What, you know, what is it right now in your life where the power of God is desperately needed? Maybe it's a physical illness. Maybe it's a, a relationship challenge. Maybe it's... Uh, Somebody, a friend or a familial member who's really struggling, do you, know, do you believe that Jesus can? Do you believe that Jesus really does have that kind of power? To so the guy in his 30s who's been diagnosed with incurable pancreatic cancer, to that guy, do you believe that Jesus can heal you? To the woman who's just had her third miscarriage, and the doctors just say to her, it's not going to happen for you. Do you believe that Jesus can bring new life to your family? To the, to the young woman that I prayed for a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, who was sexually abused as a child and a teenager and found herself cutting herself compulsively, you know, to her, do you believe that Jesus can heal your heart? Do you, do you, do you believe that he has the power to put the, the pieces back together. Do, you know, do we wake up in the morning with confidence knowing that, that God has the power to intervene, that God has the power to transform, that God has the power to heal? To the person whose son was in a car accident a little while ago, whose son is hooked up on all kinds of machinery just to keep him going. Do you know, the father spends so much time in the hospital that when he leaves the hospital, he can still hear all the bleeps of all the monitors in his mind as he sleeps, just flicking around. You know, you know, to that guy, do you believe that Jesus can do something for your son? Do you believe Jesus can? But before we can ask, is Jesus willing? Well, we need to be convinced that Jesus is capable, that Jesus has the power, that they're not just words that we speak, but in real life today, does he have the power? There's a quote by um, A.W. Tozer, 
Oh, I love Tozer. Anyone here read Tozer? I mean, any Tozer you can get into is just good Tozer, frankly. Tozer is amazing. This is perhaps my favorite quote that captures what I hope we can take away from this passage again, Matthew 8. Here's what Tozer says. I think it's going to come up. Thank you. Anything God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. That changes the way that we read Matthew 8, don't you think? If it's true, then what we're reading in Matthew 8 of this leper coming to Jesus, it changes everything. You know, from you know, what's happening in our world, in our lives right now, if it's true, if, if, if he can. And so as this preview, as this trailer unfolds, as we begin to watch this film play, as we begin to watch this leper coming towards Jesus, it's not just a question, is it plausible, but is it possible? It is not just a question, did it happen once upon a time in a land a long way away, you know, in a place sort of many miles away, you know, but can it happen right now in this time? Does Jesus have that kind of power? Well, a few verses later, we read about another man who comes to Jesus. He's a centurion, which means he's a Roman soldier. He has a hundred men under his authority. And, and he's got this servant who's sick. And he comes to Jesus on behalf of the servant asking for help, asking for intervention. So if you look at verse 6, he says this, Lord, he says, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under my authority. I tell this one go and he goes and I tell this one come and he comes and I say to my servant, do this and he does it. Now, here is a man who gets it. This man understands you know, he, he says, Lord, I know what it is to have authority over other people. You know, so, so I say to a soldier, go, and he goes. And I, I say to another one, do this, and he does this, and he does that. And Jesus is like, I have that kind of authority over soldiers. And I, I know that you have that kind of authority over the human body. And so if you say to a disease, go, then that disease is going to go. And if you say to eyes that are closed, be open, then they will open. And if you say to ears that are, are shut up, you know, be opened and hear, then they will hear. And if you say walk, then my servants paralyze the legs will walk. You see, I'm under authority, he says. I have authority, and I know that you are in charge, Jesus. I know that everything is under your control. And in verse 13, it tells that Jesus says to the man, let it be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed in a moment. And I love what it says. It says that Jesus was amazed. It must be incredible to amaze Jesus. Really, what does it take to amaze Jesus? Faith. Faith. Jesus was amazed at this man's faith. So here's a question. Did you believe that Jesus has that kind of power? Do you believe that he can? Maybe it's hard for us because we know so much more than they did 2,000 years ago. You know, science has advanced in so many different ways. You know, our brains, you know, we have, our brains have three billion working sections controlling three different trillion, three trillion different nerve impulses. We know that our, our ears, in our ears there are 24,000 hair-like cells. Did you know that? That convert sound into nerve impulses that allow us to hear. You know, we know that within our noses, there are five centimeters of these smell receptors. It doesn't matter what size your nose is. Doesn't matter, you've still got it. You know, the same amount of smell receptors. As I was doing this research, I, I found this really fascinating thing out that apparently your nose is the same size as your thumb. And the way you find out is if you put your thumb across your nose like that, then you, you know, you're all trying it now, you know, th then you'll have an idea about how big your nose is, you know. Um, so you can try that out over coffee with one another, work out who's got the biggest nose, uh, by just looking at your thumbs. Apparently your nose is the same size as your thumb. Um, well, we have the, anyway, the point is we have these smell receptors, you know, sorry, you know. <laughs> we have 639 muscles in the body. We have 40 plus miles of nerves running through our bodies. Our hearts beat 100,000 plus times a day, pumping gallons and gallons of blood through our bodies. We know so much more that the tongue has 9,000 taste buds. Perhaps one or two of our tongues have been slightly destroyed by curries that were too hot, but... 
Um, you know, you know, eight, here's an interesting statistic that will be useful for you one day um, in a pub quiz competition. 85% of the human population can curl their tongue into. Go on, give it a go. If you can't do it, like, I want to see whether this statistic's right. If you can't do it, raise your hand. That's probably about right. That's about fair. Oh, bless you. Well, we're going to pray for you later on, okay? <laughs> Because you are clearly missing out on one of the great joys and delights of, 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 of life, really. But um, okay, Jesus knows all that stuff. He knows it. He's got it all under control. It's all under his authority. The Bible, actually, a few chapters later in Matthew 10, it says he, he knows the number of hairs on our head. It's about 100,000 on average. I think one or two of you may be just a little bit below average. Uh, but he knows it all. It's under his authority. So this Roman soldier rocks up Jesus and he says, look, I understand how this works. I think a soldier goes and he goes, you know, I say, you say to this disease, go and the disease is going to go. Jesus is in authority over every nerve and over every muscle and over every organ and over every cell in your body. And so this leper, back to the leper, he comes to Jesus and he believes Jesus can. He's already there. But what about you? What about me? What about us as a church which is centred in the heart of the charismatic evangelical movement that is rooted in the word of God and is open to the power of the spirit? What about us? Do you believe, do we believe that he can? Do you believe that he can? I don't know how you ended that in your mind. But why don't we read this together? Can we put that Tozer quote back up, Chris? So why don't we read this together as a... As a, as a creed or statement, are we going to get it? Can we say this together? Anything God has ever done, he can do now. Let's say it together. Anything God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for me. That is a statement of truth. With that in our mind, we desperately, desperately need the power of God so that we can declare it with confidence. You know, do you know, what if we live that out individually? What if we live that out as a community of faith, as the people of God here at Trinity, positioned in the world of new wine it, with absolute confidence and conviction? You know, we, we have people in here on a regular basis. Great things happened here. Last weekend, we sponsored 147 more children for Carriccio. Mm-hmm. I think that's exciting. So, mm-hmm. uh, she said it earlier. He said it earlier, but he didn't say that for the video. 147. I think that's really exciting. That's 1.3 million over the next 10 years supporting you know, extra on top of what we're already doing. That really excites me. That's incredible. Okay, we have. We, so we had. Um, we had last weekend. We've had Alan Scott in here over over in Causeway Vineyard. You know, that 300 people have been saved in the last month. People are being healed in coffee shops because the people from the church, like scattered servants, are going out into their community and they're praying for people that are sick, that are unwell, that are out on the streets. People are coming up to them and asking them about Jesus. I mean, I, do you have faith for that? You know, we have somebody like Robbie Dawkins, who, who I know is admittedly one of God's irregulars, uh, but he's an extraordinary guy. He rocks up here, he preaches, he teaches, he prays for folk, he goes across to the conservatory. There's somebody in the conservatory who, you know, who's playing pool, who's got a bad neck. Robbie walks up to him, lays out a hand, prays on him, his, necks get, his neck gets healed, and his pool improves. <laughs> I mean, why do we live like that with a greater confidence and a greater sense of conviction and belief? That is what we are about. This is the ministry of Jesus. A ministry of proclamation and demonstration. And the leper comes to Jesus and he says, I know you can, but will you? Look at verse 2 again. A man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. That tells us something about the willingness of Jesus It shows something about the willingness of Jesus because it demonstrates the heart of Jesus. Lepers did not get touched. It's why, I know that Princess Diana was incredibly popular for many of us here. We loved her. And she lived both a rich and a troubled existence. One of the reasons she appealed to me so much 
was because of what she did with those who suffered from leprosy. Somewhere along the line, it pricked bubbles of fear and spoke to me about Jesus. It reminded me of Jesus. Jesus touched this leper. Lepers did not get touched. Leprosy was like a life sentence. You know, It was a life sentence of, of never being hugged by your mates or by your family or slapped on the back or having a drink down the local with them or anything like that. No one to kiss you on the cheek. No one to wipe away the tears on your cheeks. They were never touched. And the Bible says that Jesus touched. The miracle may demonstrate his power, but the touch demonstrates his love. And Jesus, we're going to see, is willing. And he's willing, why? Because he loves. And the touch demonstrated that. He said, I'm willing, be clean. And immediately, this guy was cleansed of his leprosy. Let me just say this as the leader of this church. Make no mistake about this. It is the will of Jesus to heal. It is the will of Jesus that there be no more suffering. It is the will of Jesus that there be no more pain, that, that, that he would put an end to sickness, that he would put an end to disease. It's not a question of whether he can. It's not a question of if he will, because it is his will. The question is, when? When? And the answer to that question, when, is, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. It might be coming a little bit faster for my father at 94, who can't wait to go home. But it's coming soon. And, and, and in Matthew 8, we read the miracles of Jesus to give us hope, to give us confidence of what will be one day, to remind us that Jesus does have the power, that Jesus does have the will, and that one day he will make all things right. As we read through the Gospels, as we see examples of miracle after miracle after miracle, you know, as we live our lives, as we see different examples in the, the life of this church, in our own individual lives. Yeah, I heard a story a little while ago, and I know this is an emotive topic in the life of this particular church, because there have been people that we love who died. We'd rather they were still here, although they've gone home. They've gone home. That is our hope. That is our joy. But I just heard this story of a girl who had a tumor, and um, family, friends, people have been praying for her, and she'd gone in for surgery. She'd gone for her operation, and the doctors were going to attempt to remove this uh, tumour uh, in surgery. And, and the doctors were looking at the, the pre-op x-rays, just so they knew exactly what it was that they were doing b before they, they operated. And, and they looked at these x-rays, and they were slightly astounded and shocked to see what they saw. And eventually, they, they went out to uh, the parents, to the family outside, and, and they said, we're not going to be able to do surgery today. And the parents' hearts sank, and they said, what's wrong this time? What's gone wrong? And the doctor said, well, there's nothing to operate on. It's just not there. They said, we don't know how it happened, but it's not there. Gee, sometimes, just sometimes, we'd love to see more. We have sneak previews like that that encourage us. I call them sneak previews that encourage us. You know, we have stories in the life of this church of people that we prayed for, that we've been involved in the ministry, where people with artificial knee joints have had those knee joints replaced with natural knee joints. I've got the x-rays of pre with the artificial ones and post with the, with, with, with the real knee joints. We've, you know, we've got, I can see there's a couple in this church this morning who, who, who were unable to have children. You know, just there was no chance of them having children. Then just they were prayed for yet again, and before the IVF treatment began, they suddenly found themselves pregnant. Do we have these moments? We do have these moments that point us towards heaven. They give us a preview of what it is to come. But I want to close with a story that somebody sent me a little while ago from another minister, uh, and uh, he was he was writing about one of the celebrations he'd been at at, at New Wine some time ago. And uh, he talked about the power of the evening and how the most powerful aspect of the evening for him was not necessarily what was being played out on the stage with the band and the, uh, and the um, speaker, but what was happening down towards the front on one of the sides. And uh, he said he'd, he'd seen a, a father and a mother bring their beautiful daughter into the celebration and he noticed that she had braces on her legs and 
on her arms, and he noticed the way in which the parents held on to her so very, very tightly. And um, it, it, he said it soon became obvious to him that the, the daughter was not only physically disabled, but mentally disabled as well. And on either side of the parents and the daughter were, were an older couple who he just assumed were the um, grandparents. And every now and then, as the band be, began to sort of strike up and as the, the, this great celebration began and people began to worship, he said he could hear this girl sort of squealing and making noises. And, you know, in the moments of quietness, there was a loud noise and, and it wasn't... It didn't always fit in with what was going on, but to me, I love that. I love that. It sounds like the music of heaven to me. Somebody offering up what they can in the moment. And he said he was profoundly touched by what he, he, he saw. And then he said um, it got to the, sort of the preaching time, the speaking time on the stage, and the preacher got up and he began to speak about miracles, some of the miracles of Jesus, you know, about the feeding of the 5,000, the, the, the healing of the, 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 the demonic, you know, the healing of the blind man, the cleansing of the leper. And, and uh, this preacher just began to talk about one miracle after another miracle. And uh, and then he, he, the, the preacher even began to talk about the, the mother and father who, who were carry, you know, carrying out a dead daughter and how Jesus touched this little girl and this little girl sprang to life and how the preacher was sort of imagining the scenario of Jesus dancing with the girl and delighting in it. And then, then he just wrote this mark, but I was not really drawn to what was happening on the stage. I wasn't really drawn to what the preacher was saying. I looked over. And I saw the parents and I saw the grandparents weeping over this little girl. And they were thinking of when their little girl would be whole and well in every way one day in the future. And you just need to know it's coming soon. It's coming soon. You know, I, I've read the end of the book. I often read the end of the book before I start the book, actually, because I want to know where it's going to end up. And it's a great ending. I mean, it's slightly incomprehensible. I mean, anyone here understand Revelation? There are bits of it that are completely incomprehensible. I read the end of the book, and the writer of Revelation, John, gives us one last glimpse. It's like one last little peek of what that day will be like. And he says in Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away, and he was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. John says, let me tell you guys what's coming this world is not going to last much longer. This world is just like a, a whisper. It's just like a vapor, okay? And, and, and what is soon coming is a place where everything will be new, where there'll be no more death, and there'll be no more mourning, and there'll be no more suffering or crying or pain. There'll be no more bloated stomachs in third world countries, no more anxious waiting rooms or empty tissue boxes or tables for one on a Saturday night. No more, no more tear-stained divorce papers, no more tiny caskets, no more. It's coming soon. And we will be in a place where we will, perhaps slightly more effectively than we did in the kids' swap this morning, laugh and dance and sing and pray and worship for all of eternity. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss it. So when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying for the future to break in. Do you know the kingdom's coming? Do you, know, you just need to know this, and with this I wrap it up. I don't talk about the now and the not yet anymore, which is the ancient language of this church and the movement of which we've been a part. Because I think the not yet has been a get out cause for too many of us over the years. It's like a get-out-of-jail card, which means we don't go for it anymore. But we need to lean into this stuff that Jesus calls us to. And so we talk about, here now, the now and the coming. It is now and it's coming. Because it is. And so we just pray for more foretaste of that which is coming in the here and the now. But we wait for what is coming, which is just around the corner. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. And of course,